Hello, welcome to the Petty Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Petty. Today's topic is going to be a little different. It's about uh, my latest edition, the second edition of my forensics engineering textbook. For a better part of 20 years, almost 25 now, I've worked in the forensics engineering field. Uh, in 2013, I wrote a seminal book for the insurance industry on how to do inspections for disputed claims. Um, and lo and behold, eight years later, I never dreamed it would happen. They asked me to write a second edition of the book. So I did. I want to cover that just briefly. Um, many of you have asked that you see less of me and more of the screen or the screen material, so here we go. Um, the book itself is based on almost 10,000 actual inspections by my company. Um, and it is, we're proud to announce that it's endorsed, you see the little green label, by the International Codes Council. So we're real pleased to have that happen. Um, as far as the book goes, I won't spend a lot of time on all the details of the chapters, but the book is really a comprehensive bridge uh, between the engineering disciplines and the building sciences. So many engineers do not have training in carpentry, masonry, plumbing, uh, electrical, etc. And in order to figure out what's wrong when something goes wrong, you need to know how it should have been working. And many of this uh, many of these answers lie in understanding the trades. It takes us almost a year in my company to train somebody to be able to go out and do inspections. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention as I, I peel through the chapters here is that um, the book is written uh, for two purposes. One, it um, covers the types of claims you're likely to encounter in the insurance world in terms of things that are seen. Secondly, um, there really didn't exist a methodology for how to do these claims inspections, either from a technical standpoint or legal standpoint. So each of these chapters at the end includes a methodology that should be followed uh, based on, like I said, almost 10,000 inspections at this point. Uh, the book itself covers forensics engineering, which is generally uh, thought to be or interpreted to be damage to failure of equipment, machines, structures. We've expanded it in this book because of my background in health and safety to also what goes wrong not only with structures but people in structures. So that covers the industrial hygiene and safety sciences as well. It's important to understand um, the degree of certainty or probability, if you will, when you make conclusions. And so part of the, in, in the introductory sections of the book, I define these terms. If the probability is zero, then that means it's not possible. If it's possible, then that would mean, obviously, it has a probability greater than zero. If the probability is greater than 50%, um, we call that probable. In other words, the likelihood that that conclusion from a scientific, engineering, or legal standpoint is more likely than not means it's probable. And that's an important definition because in the, in the legal science and engineering field, we want our conclusions to be more likely than not. Otherwise, they're random. I've also defined the term likely being greater than 75% probability, meaning that it's kind of a super probability. In other words, it's not just sort of just better, better than 50-50. There's, there's a high likelihood that the outcome is as we suggest. And then, of course, if you had a scenario where there was absolute certainty, then that would be 100%. So these terms are important in terms of how you draw your conclusions. One of the big problems we find in engineering is people want to claim that, that they're um, certain or likely conclusions when really the only requirement is that they be greater than 50%. So I always train and warn my engineers, don't overstate your conclusions because it's not necessary. Um, I won't work you through all of these, but we lay out in the book the process that one goes through in, or, in order to do a forensics engineering inspection. Um, this is sort of a layout chart for that. 
um, and then um, the elements that one needs to have in a written report. I am very insistent and have been for decades that we write a written report to document the findings because while you take field notes and you take readings, et cetera, if you, if you write down a written report, you're going to fill in the blanks, if you will, and sometimes your notes are pretty cryptic or if that person happens to be gone when, say, down the road litigation occurs, uh, it's hard to remember all the things that went on. So uh, I've always insisted whether the client wanted it or not that there be a written report um, documenting um, what we found. We tend to avoid recommendations because they tie down the owner or the client. In other words, if we say you should do this or that, um, then there is an obligation on their part in some respects to do that. We will present the findings and what and what the remedies are, but whether or not they're done is up, up to the client or the owner. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the book goes through the types of claims that one sees. I won't go through all of this, but water, wind, and hail in the insurance industry uh, dominate residential insurance claims. On the commercial side, um, product liability is a big deal. We don't really do that a lot of that in the forensics world, although there is some on equipment failures. Um, but water, wind, um, and then a host of other things, including fire, hail, vehicles hit homes, mold, uh, collapses, uh, mischief, ice and snow, those are all areas where you will end up having to do forensics uh, projects. I thought what would be fun here, instead of going through a lot of details, is just to show you some fun pictures of actual um, information that's in the book, as well as pictures of interesting situations. A lot of claims are out there on hail and hail damage, and I think what's fascinating is that the hailstones can get quite large. The largest one ever recorded was in South Dakota, eight inches in diameter, weighing almost two pounds. You certainly wouldn't want to be hit by that. Uh, this is a neat chart in that it looks at the maximum size of hailstones to hit any particular area in the United States. And you can see that the central U.S., the central corridor, is really where the big hail falls. This is looking at data from 1955 to 2013. Um, one of the th problems we have seen in the hail forensics area is that what we call... Um, hail fraud or artificial damage, and that is where somebody, uh, where a hailstorm goes through, but the hail may be too small to damage, say, the roofs. They'll go up there and make marks on the roof, and almost always you can tell it's artificial by the patterning. If you have a hailstorm that comes through, do you really think that that's going to be the pattern of where the hailstones hit? You should see a random patterning, and this certainly isn't random. We also do a lot of commercial roof inspections, whether they be leaks, hail damage, wind damage, etc. And um, a lot of times you need to core it to find out what's underneath. This is an example of many, many layers of roofing. Now, at some point, um, you're not allowed to put too many layers on a roof, but this is the kind of things you run into, kind of fascinating. Um, many times we have uh, situations where maintenance is an issue. Here you have a gutter that obviously is a very good location for growing plants, not such a good location for getting rid of water. When this happens, you get flow over the edges down along the foundation, and you can end up with water uh, inside the basement very easily. The other thing we see up in attics all the time, and this causes mold on the uh, OSB, is that the bathrooms are vented into the attic or piping is vented directly into the attic, then that moisture, if the attic isn't well vented, will accumulate up there. It condenses on particularly the cold surfaces if you have cold environments, and that's a perfect breeding ground for mold. The other problem we see a lot of times is, and this is a picture of uh, stone on the front of a home that's uh, had water damage, and then with the stone removed in the photographs to the right. And the problem almost always is that the flashing that was around the windows or openings isn't right. And and what can happen is remarkable in a period of a few years. You can have almost total decay of the wood structure behind the, uh, behind the brick or the uh, stucco or whatever uh, brick masonry might be present. And it almost always has to do with improper flashing. Um, Another thing we run into all the time is houses that are settling oddly or whatnot. And um, 
I, th I thought it would be fun to show you how some people's homes are supported. You can see on the left that it looks like a little piece of 4x4 four four, uh, with a concrete masonry unit brick block is uh, holding that home up. Um, probably not so well. And then to the lower right, you can see other examples where uh, people have kind of done some Rube Goldbergs in terms of supporting the uh, structure, let alone not having footers that are below frost lines there. But you can see that's not probably how you want your house supported. But we run into that a lot. Um, the other thing we run into a lot of times is that the water lines or the drain lines from the home, um, particularly if they're under a driveway, can get crushed if there's a big vehicle and then they, they block or back up and then the water that comes down the gutters through the downspouts floods out against the foundation walls and then you end up with water and mold and other problems inside a home. Here's an example. You can kind of see the top of the pipe has been crushed down and, and uh, there's gravel in behind there. So this is obvious scenario where uh, heavy vehicle traffic went over the top of the line. We have run into many homes where the, the, uh, the people are sick, feeling bad. Uh, this is hard to tell, but this is a situation, a real situation in a home where people were very sick. But the uh, down in the basement in the corner, the sewage line had been broken, and that, that's feces. That's toilet paper and feces on the floor. And when I measured biological levels, particularly bacteria, they're very high, which is a very unhealthy situation. Um, there are some good findings out there. Um, the incidences of fire deaths and fire incidents with time, and this is going back from almost 1900 forward, has really dropped, and that has a lot to do with uh, smoke detectors and smoke alarms. One of the things we run into in fires, though, is the question always comes up, um, is the concrete or the steel okay or not? And... You really don't have time in the insurance world to core the block or core the concrete, send it out to a lab and make sure it's okay. You certainly could do that, but it might take weeks and everybody's impatient. They want to have conclusions. They want to have the money flow and have things rebuilt. So an interesting phenomena is that if the um, concrete or brick have a pink to a red or a buff or very gray chalky color, they've almost always been overheated. There are theoretical reasons for that. And so if you see those colorations, then that's a problem. Uh, steel, if it's warped at all, it comes out. We don't leave it there. The other problem, though, is it may not be warped, but it may have a lot of fire residual on it. And what looks like a condom on the right is actually a test you can do in the field to look at uh, chloride and sulfide levels. And if they're too high, then obviously that has to be cleaned. Otherwise, it will ac accelerate corrosion on those elements. We do run into situations, here's a real situation that I did, where a vehicle, um, it, was, it kind of was on a street that dead-ended into another street, but the um, individual here went, uh, we're not sure what happened, uh, but the person went through the intersection across the, uh, the next street directly into a home and um, hit the home at something like 60 miles an hour. The individual was killed, but... What happens here, you can see the porch is completely collapsed in the bottom. And the question is, how much damage was done to the home? And these are very time-consuming uh, projects because you literally have to go from the basement through the attic and onto the roof to make sure there are no uh, damages caused by the recent incident. And part of that is looking for the status of cracks, whether they're new or old. New cracks tend to be bright in color with no debris. Older cracks, having been there for months to years, tend to be with debris or duller in color. And the book talks about aging cracks. This is another project I did. Uh, three people were killed here. This is where a propane leak occurred in a home and built up and then ignited and uh, blew debris for a quarter of a mile. Um, and I had to do the inspection here as well as the adjacent home. Um, so you can see chunks of plywood up in the trees. Pretty impressive, um, pretty unfortunate. The other thing that's not so fun is uh, we have to go out and do uh, tornado uh, damage inspections. Um, 
And this is just a map of where tornadoes tend to occur. Again, they tend to occur in the middle and southeastern parts of the country, along with the Midwest. This is a picture looking through um, a town in Kentucky. And we did the inspections throughout the town. Now, the, the, the structures and the buildings in the center are destroyed. There's nothing really to look at there. But the structures on either side need to be looked at for, it's really kind of meatball forensics. It's whether they can be repaired or whether they're damaged and totaled. And uh, these are interesting inspections because there's not a lot of infrastructure, food, uh, shelter, uh, toilets, facilities. Um, and so you work long hours, but it is, it is uh, fascinating work because you hear some tremendous stories. Um, the other area that we get into is lightning damage, um, particularly in HVAC equipment. And it turns out a lot of people think when there's a storm that comes through and the air conditioner doesn't work that, that that's what caused it. But typically the compressor doesn't fail in a lightning storm. It, that will fail most of the time based on experience on old age. What happens in a lightning storm is that the either the, the contactor points get uh, melted um, or the run capacitor is literally blown apart. And this is an example of one that was blown apart in a project that I did. And uh, those tend to protect the compressor in an odd way. But if you see that sort of thing, then that means that unit did get hit by lightning. Um, we do, up in the northern climate, see a lot of freeze damage. This was a 10-story building with uh, a water line going up through the concrete block. It took me almost two hours to chisel out the block to get to this point. And you can see that the classic freeze failure, the pipe is split longitudinally. When we went and tested then for the water leak, you can see the water squirting out. So that ended up flooding the entire building. So it was a tremendous loss, but there you see the cause right there. Lock, it was really caused by um, loss of power and then lack of heat. This is another example of freeze failure on a copper plumbing in a home. Again, the classic failure is longitudinally piping is designed to fail, not circumferentially, but along its length. And that's done for safety reasons because it tends not to fail catastrophically there. On the other hand, when that does fail, you end up with lots of water flying out and causing problems. Again, I hope you enjoyed this. A little bit of a summary of uh, some of the work that I've done over the years outside of... Uh, masks, if you will. And uh, if you get a chance, please look at the book. I want to thank Taylor Francis for all their help in getting the second edition published. Thank you. Have a great day.